amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the minister of the hour, God. We thank you that your spirit has fell in this place. It's moving in the sanctuary, on the sanctuary, through the sanctuary. We thank you, God, that you're walking right now in the neighborhood of our hearts. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that you touch Minister Smith as she brings the teaching. Let it expound off of the page into our spirits. And we promise to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Help her out. Balance out the sanctuary for us real quick. Just move with expediency. I did it to her. I moved her. Can you put for me Isaiah 22? If everyone has your Bibles, will you please? Yes, ma'am. Will you please turn to Isaiah 22? Mm, good, good word. And this chapter really touched my heart tremendously. The title of it is A Burden About Jerusalem. And it touched my heart so because I have seen, we all know, first of all, that Isaiah was a prophet. And we know that Isaiah has always had a burden for the people and for them walking in holiness and righteousness. And that Isaiah heard from the Lord. And that is why we are on this chapter, because it says a burden about Jerusalem. I just want you to think for a moment, is there anything that you have a burden about that's taking place in our nation, in your neighborhood, and around you? Anything that is burdened you that would cause you to cry out. And as the more I read this chapter, I thought about us having the privilege and the honor of having a prophet in our own home and our own house. And having her here as a prophet allowed me to see what it meant for a prophet to cry out for people. And if you would, just it says the burden about Jerusalem. The burden of the valley of vision. What aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the housetop. Isaiah had a burden for the people of Jerusalem. And you know with the studies that Pastor Adam and Prophetess has done about all of the word that has come to the people of Jerusalem and about what was taking place. But at this time, Isaiah being a prophet, God gave him a burden about the people. And the burden of the Lord against the valley of the vision is Isaiah weeping and prophesying. His spirit man was grieved because he has a burden for the people because they had turned away from God. It made me think about us in the United States of America and our nation. It made me see when prophetess brought the stand out here and she had the word Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, she circled U.S. We were a nation that was born from our forefathers coming over who did not want to in stay enslaved and came to this nation, and our nation was founded on the word of God. But are we a nation now that stands on the word of God? And if we are not, are you burdened enough to weep and cry? along with the prophet of our house. We have seen prophetess weep and cry for our nation. Weep and cry for the pulpit ministers and the churches whose leaders are falling. I began to see all of that taking place, and my heart was weeping and crying. It's a spirit of gratefulness that we have a pastor that hides the prophet in the house. 
but allows her to minister not only to us, but to the nation and to other people. But in this particular scripture, they didn't hear Isaiah as we've heard Prophet Isaiah. They didn't hear him as he was ministering to the people in the Valley of the Vision. So our nation was founded on the very principles of God. And Judah is hearing from the prophecy of Isaiah. And Isaiah was that he was weeping. And we often hear that Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. But now we see that Isaiah is also weeping for the land and for what was taking place in Israel and what was taking place in Judah. And he was crying for that. It says, the burden of the valley of the vision, what aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the top? Thou art full of stairs and tumultuous cities, a joyous city, that slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead to the battle. All thy rulers fled together. They are bound by the archery. All that are found in thee are bound together which are fled from afar. Therefore said I, look away from me. I will weep bitterly, labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughters of my people. We all know that Jerusalem was the heart and the people of Jerusalem was God's heart. But at the same time, they had turned away from him and they sought out other gods. And so Jerusalem was the place of a sinner worship. Judah and the people have chosen to follow other gods, not the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. They have chosen to follow idol gods. So therefore, the Lord had given Isaiah that vision, and he was standing watching the people looking up as they were doing their thing, and he was weeping down in the valley. Now, if you think about us today as a nation, it's kind of backwards. The people up high in their towers, doing their things in their high-rise apartments in New York City and around in the Sprint Center all across this nation. And they're not believing in or hearing the prophets, the prophets who are giving the word for our nation. In the White House, they're doing their thing. Our leaders and everyone is doing their thing, but their thing is not the thing of God. If you think about us as a nation, how far we have strayed away from God. The Twin Towers, they were high, but they fell low. Think they came down because there was a prophet who had given out that we as a nation had turned from God, and if we don't come back to God, what happens? We suffer the judgment. And God has sent us people to warn us about that, but what do we do as a group of people? We go ahead and we go up to our housetops. We go up to our different organizations and things and we stay there and we don't remember the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. And since we don't remember them and in the land that we are in, therefore, here comes disaster. And as we read on down, you're going to see that. It says, I wept bitterly. Isaiah, a true prophet, felt deeply and tragically for the fallen and the apostate of the people. God's people were being destroyed, and he grieved for them for their portrayal to God. While others were experiencing joy and having a good time, the prophet had to share the sorrow of God. See, God was speaking to him about what was taking place just as God is speaking to us today. It's no different than what Isaiah was saying then as what we have been hearing from the pulpit about our nation, about our homes, 
about our cities, about our states, telling us to be prepared to share the word of God with fan, friends and family. If you look, we're on what right now? We're on a consecration. And with that con consecration comes a time that we should be able to hear from God about where we stay, where we work, who should we vote for, what we need to do to weep for our community, to weep for our home, to weep for our family, to be that light, a group of people who will not satisfy. We know that God loved Israel because Israel was what? The apple of his what? He was the apple of his eye. He loved that land. But at the same time, he gave Isaiah a word for them because of the sin that they were in and what they had done. And if you turn over as we read Deuteronomy, or I can read this for you, Deuteronomy 11 and 11 says, but the land where the ye go are possessed is the land of hills and layers and drinketh water of rain and heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year and even until the end of the year. So no matter what land you in or where you are, the eyes of who are upon you? The eyes of the Lord. Just as in the day with Isaiah, he is also watching us in the land and what we are doing. And Deuteronomy 14 and 23 says, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there the tide of thy corn and the wine and of thy oil and the firstling of thy herds and of thy flock, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Now we're in a church that for 13 years as prophets, and I know you've heard Pastor Nemskay, we've been kind of hidden on the backside. You have to get off the highways and the byways and turn and go to the red light and go down and then take a left and come down the road and then take a right and then you're here. But high up above us on the housetop is a big tank that says Lee Summit. And we know that Lee Summit is a place where it's prospering and it's growing, but also in the midst of the land here in Lee Summit, we know that there is where we are being healed from people from prejudice, abuse. There are accidents that are happening. There's murder. There's a young man that was murdered on the highway in his truck from road rage right up here on 291. Was there anyone that wept and lamented over his life and weep for the city and weep for his death? just violently taken. So as we are a group of people here, and I shared that with prophetess because we had just left church that day and I drove by and I saw it. So I saw them with Sister Pat here and I saw it and I saw the highway marked off and I saw the, la the gentleman laying in the road and saw the truck. I just presumed that he had fell off the back of the truck and there was an accident. Did not know that it was a murder. But it touched my heart when I found out what has happened because this young man had been in the service and had went and served his country, mm. but came back here and got killed on the highway. Yeah. My heart wept and lamented. I said, prophetess, what do I do? She says, daughter, go stand and repent for the murder and for the land and put some oil there in the ground and repent. You can't be connected to a prophet in a house that has a mission and a vision and a burden for God's people and not repent. No, I hadn't did anything, but I have a son. What if that was my child? What was that if your child? Have we become such a nation that just don't bother us, that we don't repent for the murder of a young man 
who was only trying to get up a lawnmower to start his business. Pastor Adam. Yeah, I, I just want to look at the text by itself, just the wordplay that God uses in this teaching. All right, he's called, uh, he called Jerusalem the valley of the vision. And he didn't say the mountain of the vision. Y'all going to talk to me. Yes. The mountain valley. of the vision would be you be on a high place. Yes. Normally, when you're looking for, you, when you can see things, you see from high. But no, Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains, yes. and it sits low. Yes, it is. In the valley, y'all not going to talk to me. In the Go valley, ahead, it's, the it's valley. tougher because you're down low. So when you're going through the most is where you can see the most vision. Because you got all these mountains of struggle and all these mountains of pain and all these mountains of hurt and all these mountains surrounding you. But God then speaks to you while you're sitting in the valley. Yes. How many people have been in a dark, low place and God spoke to you the most? He uses the prophets and the prophets recognize Jerusalem is where they can hear God. Because when they're in Jerusalem, they're always sitting in the valley. Yes. Always Amen. sitting in a low place. You can't be high minded when you're sitting low. Come on, Pastor. Amen. This, this text is so powerful, so powerful because you have to have a burden for the things of God, even at your lowest point. We always think God is so grand and all God is so good. It's easy to think that when we're at our highest place. Yes, amen. Babylon was considered the desert by the sea. Because although it had opulence and had money, it was dry spiritually. But all, even though you're in a low place, can I tell you that uh, rainwater comes from the mountain's top down to the low place. The grass is always more fertile down in your low place. Y'all go talk to me. Things that you've been dealing with, yes, it may seem bad, but if you look down close, you'll notice that your opportunities are always there when you're in the low place. Yes, yes, Whenever you need to be with God, you don't get up high. You get down in your low place. And Jerusalem sat in the valley, a place where you can see God because you are willing to be humbled and get low. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. And Jeremiah says in 14, 18, to go along with the pastor, it says, If I go forth into the field, then behold the slain with the sword. And if I enter into the city and behold them that are sick with phantom, yea, both the prophet and the priest go about into the land that they not know. Has thou utterly rejected Judah? Has thy soul lofted Zion? Why has thou smitten us and there is no healing for us? We looked for peace and there was no, there is no good. Looked for peace and, the, and looked for peace for thy healing and behold trouble. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, our wickedness and the iniquities of our fathers for we have sinned against thee. And when we're at that low place and we're looking for God and we go to him, he answers us. And when we answer us, we're able to get up out of that valley, in that low place, go back and do what Isaiah said and, and weep and repent. We take those sins now and we take those things, those crosses, we don't have to carry because Jesus is no longer on that cross. So we can leave them right there and give them to him and we can still do what he wants us to do, and that's to weep and to lament and to thank him for what he's doing and what he's going to continuously do for us. Amen? Does anybody, we have some mics. You all want to join in? Please do. All right. 
If not, let's get back. We're on verse 5. Uh, for it is a day of trouble and of the treading down of the perplexity by the Lord of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of crying of the mountain. And Elam bare the quiver with the chariots, men and horsemen, and Kerr uncovered the shield. And it shall come to pass that thy choicest valley shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. And he discovered the covering of Judah, and lo, did look in the day of the armor of the house of the forest. Ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many, and ye gather together the water of the lower pool. And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have ye broken down to fortify the city. So as, Jer as Isaiah and as Judah kept going, and as they kept and they were troubled, they still, Isaiah was still warning them about what was taking place down in the valley. The officials, our officials today, we see how our officials are coming and being exposed for the wrong that they're doing. Just like that they were then, our FBI, our CIA, our mayors. We even have the television announcers. We have people that have all type of allegations that is coming against them. So the judgment that God was doing back then and Judah is the same judgment that we're receiving today. People may think that they are getting away with it, but because of the righteous men and women of God who are praying and weeping and interceding, God is allowing all of the trouble in the world to be exposed today, and we're able to see what is taking place. We're able to see how the unbelief of the people is taking place the sin of the people. And as they were back then when they had the idols and the things that were plaking, taking place back there, and he had to walk through and see those idols, it reminded me of, um, Rochelle, could you pull up Acts 17? And I want to read it out of the NLT. Because the officials that they had in place just decided We've heard the saying, oh, let's drink and eat and be merry, for tomorrow will not come. People seem to think that that's not going to happen. Uh, start at verse 16, please. When Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he, deeply, he was deeply troubled by the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicureans and with the Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what this babbler's trying to say with the strange idea he's picked up? Others said he seems to be preaching about the foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about the new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather, you are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that the Athenians as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all of their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as the following. Men of Athens, I noticed that you were religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had an inscription on it, to the unknown God the God whom you worship without knowledge, is the one I'm talking about. 
He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and the earth, he doesn't live in a man-made temple. And humans' hands can't serve his need, for he has no need. He himself gives life and breathes to everything, and he satisfied every need. Back in May there, they're wishing all type of idols, the same as it was in Judah, as the same it is our day, when we walk alone. You got people who are wishing the moon god, the sun god, all different type of idols that they have in their lives. But are these idols any good? Will they save you? They were back in that day having their money as in our day. We put our money up, we save our money, but can money buy you health? When you pray to that idol, does it heal you? Does that idol help your children? So in this day, I see with the city officials that we have, when they commit wrong in an office, they're exposed even if they are worshiping to their idols. But the true living God that we serve, the God that we should be able to take into the marketplace to people, that they will see that there's something different about us, just like Paul. We should be able to be that light in that deep valley when trouble comes, that when we go into the marketplace, people should be able to look at us that's why they walk up to Sister Pat's desk. That's why they ask Sister Rochelle. That's why Sister DeAndrea was talking and gave her testimony. That's why Deacon Isaiah was able to bring two sets of visitors to church on Sunday. Because in the midst of people looking for something that they can't find, you can only find it in Jesus. You can't find it in an idol. You can't find it in a car. You can't find it in the White House. You can't find it in Donald Trump. You can't find it in your mayor. You can't find it in your ADT system either. You can't find it in your new car. You can't find it at the hair store. You can only find it in Jesus Christ. You can't find it in, the, in a penthouse. You can't find it in a $600,000 house. You can't find it in a Rolls Royce. I heard a story about a gentleman, and if we're not seeking God and praying to him, and if we take our eye off of God like Judah took their eye off of God and sent Isaiah had to come back and warn them, and they said, there he is babbling again. How many people have we brought to church and says, y'all church too long? They always babbling. Y'all prophet. She's always, they call it babbling. Or talking too much. Or how did she know my business? But none of them ever thought that maybe God was trying to save you. Or save them. Heard a story about a gentleman who for 38 years, he never did anything wrong and was always had his eye on work and he was good took his eye off for God, had a Rolls Royce, drove home a physician. One day he decided that he stopped at the bar. Stopped at the bar, got a drink, started drinking and drank too much. Ran over a curb, ran into a house, killed a two-year-old baby in the bed. He's serving life in prison. See, when we take our eye off for God, and we think our Rolls Royce, our job, our high lawyers we got on speed dial for our tickets and whatever we got that's going to take place didn't work. She's serving a life sentence for her death. So if our eye is not kept on Jesus, God has already shown us in the book of Isaiah when we don't listen to the prophet. And the number one prophet wrote the book, Jesus Christ. So what is it that we don't get about Jesus was a prophet? I don't understand. I really don't. Was he a prophet or wasn't he a prophet? He was a prophet. So if 
he was the prophet who walked on the face of the earth, who died and was resurrected and is now sitting, sending us a prophet, an apostle who flows in a prophet. What is it about the word we can't get on Sunday and Wednesday? That we can't get a deliverance meeting, that you don't have to go in the bar. We've got shepherds that said, before you sin, pick up the telephone and call. I'll come get you. So you won't have to serve a life sentence for one mistake when you take your eye off of Jesus. What is it about that that we don't get? That that same word back then holds for us now. That this was the warning. 38 years and serving a life sentence at 53 for the murder of a two-year-old who was in her bed sleeping. What is it that we can't read the canopy prayer? We can't sprinkle the blood of Jesus over our house. See, but you can't get that from Buddha. You can only get that if you're planted in the house of the Lord. You can only get that if you attend Bible study. You can only get that if you're here on Sundays and Wednesdays and deliverance meetings, and then you take the word that they give you home and the scriptures that they give us, and we apply them on an everyday basis so those things won't happen to us. If I don't keep my eye on Jesus and my knees in prayer, we all are walking through on something. None of us are perfect. But I do know and pastor and, and prophetess will tell you, I'm one who's going to pick up the phone and call. And if I can't get them, look out, Sister Kiara. Look out, Sister Jessica. Look out, Sister Pat. Somebody going to agree with me. I'm going to keep calling until I get somebody. Why is it that we can pick up the phone in our society? We can call the doctor's office 15 times to make an appointment. You break your glasses, you can call. You're going to call. You call, I need my prescription. I need my prescription. Why they can't get me my prescription? But you can't pick up the phone and get your prescription from your shepherd. But then we wind up like Judah in trouble. That's what Isaiah warning, that's what the prophet weeps for, cries for and laments. Because I'm one in my family. Because my children aren't here serving with me yet. I have one who is in another church who's saving, who's serving now. Now, did I say she was perfect? No, but she's come a long way. She called prophetess last week and said, prophetess just wanted to call you and let you know that Home Depot is hiring. They're paying $10 an hour and they give insurance if anybody in the church. You know what I did? I ran around in circles. Do you know what it takes for your child to pick up a phone and call a prophet? Especially when they can read what was wrong. See, I can talk about my own. I ain't talking about y'all now. I'm talking about my own. And she ran because she could read her just like Isaiah. See, I took it personal. But I also took it where I heard what Isaiah said. So, see, I don't have to go through what the people in Judah went through. Because what I see was not what I saw. What I saw was her being in church. It's where she is right now. So now if God did it, I got, I got two more that are on their way. And I don't care what you said. They saved. They're walking in church. They're going to pay their tithes and their offering because God said it. The prophet said it. It said those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish like the green tree of Lebanon. My seed shall rise up and call me blessed. Did you hear me say rise up? I didn't say lay down and be put in the grave. I said rise up. That means get up. To rise up, you have to be alive. So we have to take this word. So what God did for me, God would do for you. It's just up to us to get in the house of the Lord and get prepared and seek God's face. And when the prophet is weeping and lamenting and giving us instruction, just receive it. The disciples received it.
And those that didn't receive it like Peter came back and got it right. So why we can't come back and get it right? What they say is in the book, baby. But if you don't open the book, baby, you won't know what's in the book, baby. And if you want to ride, if you want to run around like a little hamster on a wheel, if you like it, I love it. Because I'm not going to get on the wheel with you. I'm not going to do it. I got on the roller coaster when we went to Six Flags and threw up. I know I'm not getting on the wheel. <laughs> uh-uh. You don't have to. No, no, no. So some things we just have to receive. Because it's in the book, and God said it, and we're all here. So I'm not going to finish all of this, but I'm going to leave this out, and I just want to challenge you all. Finish reading. Our pastor them may pick it up, the rest of it, because that is so good. It, it just, you just look at it and apply it to us today in our workforces, on our jobs. Be the one that stands in the gap. Be the one that sees the injustice, and just go pray. You may have to go in the bathroom and close the stall and cry because you saw an injustice to someone else. But you know that your word says wherever the soles of your feet is, you touch is holy ground. So if you're walking on that and God showed it to you and you're holy, you ought to be able to change it. To intercede to where you may not see it happen then, but I guarantee you sooner or later, God's justice will prefer because he says he's no prospective of person. He said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. God says, I have no hands but the one that Pat has. I have no eyes but the one that Anne Marie has. I have no feet but the one that Deacon Gary walked with. I have no mouth unless Dante will open it and speak for me. So God can't move in your marketplace if you don't move. Is there anybody in the land that is willing to weep like Isaiah? Is there anybody in here that's willing to stand and weep for your neighborhood, for your home, for your cities, for your children, for your church, for our nation, for our children that are going back to school? Is anybody here willing to say, I'm standing here and I'm calling y'all to agree with me? There will not be a person that's going to come to Longfellow Elementary with a gun and come through the door because I'm weeping and I'm lamenting it. And I'm sprinkling the blood of Jesus over my neighborhood. Is there anybody willing to stand and weep for your workplace? And Marie stands and weeps for the preemie babies that are born and the parents that come in. That's our job. So we all have the call of Isaiah. Because where we are, we are planted, and we know that that word applies to us. In our private time, we have a burden. You have a burden. If you don't have one during this time of consecration, I decree that God's going to give you one. Because we all need one. Everybody still is in the marketplace, aren't we? Then we should have a burden for something at work that's not right. We should have a burden that people could get on Facebook and text and get a copy of and record the duck boat sinking but not praying and speaking in tongues. See, I have a burden for that. Because if I was recording, I'd have been, Lord, they will not go down. Have we become so desensitized to the world and the things of the world that we don't stop and pray when we see an accident? That it's just business as usual? It's like getting a paper towel, wiping our face, and throwing it in the garbage. It's not a human life. We should have burdens for things and just pray and give it to the Lord and allow him. So thank you so much. God bless you. Pastor Adam, I turn this over to you.